Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Corey Brunson, and I'm talking today with Sarah Brain, author of the new book, Predict and Surveil, Data, Discretion, and the Future of Policing, published last year, 2021, by Oxford University Press. The collection and use of so-called big data has become pervasive across not only academic research, but in marketing, healthcare, and politics. Regarding no domain, are these tools more contested than in law enforcement? And perhaps regarding no domain, are they less understood? Dr. Brain is an assistant professor of sociology at UT Austin, who spent two years conducting fieldwork with the LAPD to develop a detailed picture of how advanced data collection and analysis are adopted and employed, and of how this shapes the practice and culture of policing and their consequences for policed communities. Her book has direct policy and legal implications for the practice and oversight of law enforcement, but I think it will also contribute in new ways to dialogues about the use of big data in other fields. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for making time. To begin with, could you give an overview of your own research background? Sure. So my PhD is in sociology and social policy, um, and I use a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods to answer my research questions. This particular book is really focused um, on ethnographic research, doing interviews and observations with individuals in the field. But in the past, I've um, done research with survey data, observational data um, as well. Uh, And in terms of my research background, my focus and my interest is on the criminal legal system broadly. Um, I have studied things like how people's involvement in the criminal legal system, whether they've been, you know, stopped by the police, arrested, convicted or incarcerated, how that then subsequently shapes their involvement with other kinds of institutions like medical and financial institutions. Um, and so I think that surveillance is sort of the, the overarching um, social process that I'm using sociological methods to study. And the focus of this book is really on the, the feeder mechanism into the broader criminal legal system, which is police contact. And so it may be unnecessary to ask this follow-up question, but maybe could you give some more detail about how you came into that research agenda or specifically this book project? Sure. I mean, I think that when I started graduate school, you know, I was I was interested in the criminal legal system. And a lot of the work that was being done um, at the time was on mass incarceration, sort of the end of the criminal legal process. And um, that's very interesting and important. But there was a lot of work being done on that. And particularly from a policy perspective, you know, I think that moving earlier into the process, understanding, as I mentioned, the feeder mechanism into the criminal legal system, um, there's a lot of potential for policy policy interventions on that front end. And also there was this gap in our understanding in how the police were using, you know, at the time it was it was called big data. Now people are focused more on AI or predictive algorithms. Um, but there was all of this, this buzz around big data. This is in about 2012, 2013, and how it was transforming everything from like finance to sports, um, you know, medicine, advertising, criminal justice. But there wasn't really very much data on police use of big data. And so I realized, you know, that's where the ethnographic methods came in, that I would sort of have to collect the data myself in order to understand it on the ground. So first, to cover some basics uh, leading into the, the meat of the book, you say different ways throughout that states have collected data about their constituents and law enforcement agencies have used these data in practice for as long as they've existed. What is new about data collection and surveillance today? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point. So a lot of the rhetoric coming out of Silicon Valley around uh, the use of data and and new surveillance technologies is that everything is new and disruptive, right? And I think as you just touched on in that question, there actually is a long history um, of the states Uh, or sorry, not the states, of the state using data um, in order to govern, in order to allocate resources, these types of things. But I think that a couple of the things that are new, um, the first is the growing role of the private sector in public surveillance. So, you know, increasingly the state or police departments are relying on private companies, private tech companies, for example, to design the analytic platforms that they use to analyze data, or they are purchasing private 
privately collected data rather than collecting the data themselves. So I think the the privatization is one key component of it. And um, also, I think an important dynamic um, at play now is the speed of data analytics today, that a lot of these um, data collection sensors are collecting data in real time, just about just as we go about our everyday lives, we're leaving these growing digital trails um, in our wake. You know, we leave cell phone traces, um, traces of internet usage, even driving your car on, on, on roads. There are cameras everywhere picking up your vehicle. And so this passive sort of data shedding that we are doing throughout the course of every day, I think the, the scope and scale of that is really unprecedented. Yeah, and your your comment about passivity may be relevant to my next question, which is about how these how this new environment uh, has the narrative surrounding it. Uh, much of it is motivated or justified um, by the expectation that these new data intensive tools will limit the role of individual bias in the criminal legal system. Mm-hmm. And so I have a two pronged question about that. Uh, first, is individual bias the most important source of bias for us to focus on? But second, what other impacts of these tools should we be attentive to? Yeah, so it is very much the case that um, some advocates of data-driven decision-making uh, contrast it with problematic, you know, highly discretionary human decision-making. And to a certain extent, I think that's a little bit of a false binary um, in the sense that, you know, data is ultimately deployed by human beings, the decisions about what data to collect, on whom, how to analyze it, for what purpose you're using it. These are all still very fundamentally human decisions as well. And so I think, you know, when people say, oh, we're replacing human discretion with, you know, quote unquote, objective data, that's a big oversimplification of what's actually sort of going on. And I also don't think that discretion, um, human discretion is always a bad thing, um, right, procedure. And so I think that, you know, a lot of the focus is on reducing bias and and, and problematic human discretionary assessments. But I think that sometimes that's a little bit of a of a a kind of red herring in the story. Um, And uh, in, in terms of what we should actually be attentive to as well, I mean, one of the most common critiques is that this sort of garbage in, garbage out, right? The training data that's fed into predictive algorithms, if it reflects existing biases or inequalities in society, then of course the predictions are going to be um, biased as well. Or if you think about the how predictive algorithms work, they're essentially holding up a mirror into to the past and reflecting that into the future. Um, and so it sort of encodes a number of biased and discriminatory practices and projects them into the future in that kind of way. But what I think is really key and what we need to pay attention to here is the role that data and quantification and computation and and abstraction to a certain degree actually plays in obscuring what is going on, right? So it in a way, it can serve to sort of hide some of the the biased and discriminatory human decision making practices, um, but it also serves to legitimize them sometimes in the sense that numbers are sometimes less legally contestable than um, problematic uh, decision making frameworks that people can can say have you know disparate impact or are racist or all of these types of things. But again, I sort of think it's a, it's a false binary sometimes. I wonder if I could ask you to take just a moment and go a little bit into more detail about your view of this upstreaming, as I took it from the book, of discretion, where instead of operating at the point of contact, it operates in, for example, which regions, areas, or uh, types of people are targeted for surveillance. Yeah, yeah. Upstreaming is is a good word. I think that's that's your credit. I don't think I've actually said it exactly like that. But yeah, one of the findings um, in the book is that contrary to sort of the popular account that data is replacing discretion, I think that what I found is that it's actually just displacing discretion, moving discretion to earlier phases of the criminal legal process, right? So 
By that, I mean the decisions that individuals and police departments are making about what data to collect and analyze on which people, and then what interventions, what police practices to do based on those data, those are highly discretionary decisions. And they are decisions made by people situated in organizations, policing organizations, institutions that are highly hierarchical. They they um, are, are political. There are all of these different power dynamics at play, really fundamentally social relations that shape the decisions about what data you're even going to use and why. So taking a moment to dig a bit more into the methodology you used, um, could you say how you planned and executed your data collection framework and a bit about your post field work analysis of those data? Sure. So um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I when I decided I wanted to study police use of big data, um, I realized that I, w- I would really have to go and collect some of the data myself. And um, I decided to, to study the LAPD, not because it's sort of a modal police department or a representative police department in any way. It's not, but rather because it's sort of on the front lines. It's one of the more technologically advanced police departments. And that's, you know, in part simply because it's it's the third largest law enforcement agency in the United States. It has a large budget. Um, but there are also specific factors to the LAPD as to why they were sort of earlier earlier adopters of some of these data-driven decision-making tools. So for example, um, you know, the LAPD was under a federal consent decree wherein they needed to um, adopt data-driven decision-making practices in favor of some of the, the problematic practices that they were going to get sued over, essentially. Um, and so I picked the LAPD because it was sort of a leader in this field. Um, and I didn't have any pre-existing contacts in, in LA or, or in the LAPD. I'd actually never been to LA before until the first day that I conducted my field work there. Um, and so at the beginning, I was interested, I, I was looking both to the LAPD, NYPD, and Chicago PD. And I was like, look, I'm just going to try and get access to all three. Um, and, and as a researcher, as an ethnographer, depending on where I have the best access, I, I will sort of go with that. And it would be a, a different different findings that I would have in each of the different police departments. But I think all of them would be interesting and important. Um, so once I had someone in the LAPD who was sort of like what I would call a data evangelist, somebody who is really optimistic about the potentials of big data to transform policing um, for the better, who was sort of open to speaking with me, I decided to just like move out to LA for six weeks to see what kind of access I got, you know, before I fully committed. Um, and, and those six weeks, you know, there was a lot of like cold calling and awkward interviews and that type of thing. But I also realized, you know, there, it was just such a rich field site where, you know, every ride along I would go on, I would learn something new. Every interview would, would yield another contact, another interview. And so I just did what's called snowball sampling, basically um, asking individuals to introduce me to other people based on the types of questions that I was asking. And I was interested initially just in very descriptively understanding the landscape of police use of big data. How was sort of a technologically advanced law enforcement agency um, um, using data? And I one of the benefits of the ethnographic approach is I was able to be in the field for an extended period of time. And so I was able to observe change over time, right? I was able to look at divisions in Los Angeles that went from not using predictive policing algorithms to using predictive policing algorithms and and see and observe in real time how people sort of reacted to these changes um, and kind of map the changes and continuities in that way. You touched in your answer on uh, the topic of my next question, which is a recurring theme of the book, uh, the determinants of technology adoption. Historically, what factors have influenced when and how police departments have adopted these kinds of analytic tools? Uh, I mean, so big change in police departments often follows from consent decrees, basically. Police departments get in trouble um, for something, and then in exchange for the withdrawal of a criminal charge, they need to comply by certain standards. And so in the context of LA, like, of course, the, you know, 1990s was not a good decade for the LAPD. They were embroiled in a lot of, like, pretty high-profile um, scandals. And so the consent decree was really what ushered in um, some of these new data-driven approaches and tools. But another really key component of what was going on here is the broader geopolitical context. And that has to do with um, 
in the wake of the terrorist attacks of 9-11, um, there was increased funding from federal agencies to local law enforcement agencies who were to, considered to sort of be on like the front lines of the domestic war against terror, if you will, because they were the ones that were on the street sort of doing that data collection, that surveillance on the ground. And so what ended up happening basically is there was this in, increased flow of federal funds to local law enforcement agencies like the LAPD um, to collect data and then share it with federal entities through through institutions like fusion centers, which are these sort of data aggregation centers and whatnot. So I think there's, you know, the the tech story of, you know, increasing tech firms in, in sort of this era of big data, we're focusing, you know, less on causation, more on correlation. Let's sort of get this massive corpus of data and see, throw it against the wall, see what types of insights we can get. At the same time, you had this like military and counterinsurgency story um, at play. And then this broader political economy of how law enforcement agencies try and seek legal legitimacy. Um, through adopting data-driven decision-making practices. So I think there's a number of sort of intersecting factors at play at the same time. So a related, I guess, more local version of the same question. Uh, in a later chapter, you describe common characterization of police as a homogeneous monolith. Mm. Uh, you point to great heterogeneity across departments and units with respect to the implementation of big data type tools. Uh, so one question, I have about this is why is it that police reactions to new technologies are understudied to begin with? Uh, but second, what accounts for the heterogeneity in their reactions to these tools and their uptake? Mm, yeah, yeah. The I mean, the heterogeneity or the variation within the police department, I must admit, was kind of a surprise to me. Um, I, ex I did not expect to find as much within department variation as I did at the beginning of this project. I, I, I thought, you know, oh, the LAPD has... X policy, and therefore, this is going to be how they do it in all the different area divisions. When instead, I found that actually, like the captains had a massive amount of discretion in determining what types of predictive tools they would use. So for example, there was like a person based predictive policing strategy used in certain area divisions. And then when I asked a captain in another division, you know, have you considered using this person based predictive policing strategy? He was like, Oh, no, that's a, you know, a civil liberties nightmare, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. And so I thought that was really interesting, just that that degree of variation um, e existed. And as a sociologist, I was, you know, very interested in sort of the organizational structure that that gave way to that. But for the first question of like, why are police reactions to these tech new technologies understudied? I mean, the simplest explanation really, I think, is one of access. Um, police departments are notoriously difficult to access, um, particularly, you know, in sort of a long term and immersive type of way, like getting punted to media relations is sort of like the kiss of death for a researcher, right? You're not going to actually be able to observe the types of decisions playing out on the ground that you need in order to do that. So I think that research access is just sort of in the simplest terms, um, one explanation for it. But I, I think like more... Um, uh, more epistemologically, another issue is that people are so focused on sort of the design of these predictive tools and technologies. You know, how can we reduce bias through design or how can we get less bias to training data or how can we get, you know, a more representative corpus of data in order to make predictions on that they don't focus then on contexts of receptions like a tool is only as in as good or as bad as its implementation is. And so I think that there's been this focus um, on the front end of the process and not so much the implementation or the context of reception, how, how the human beings that are actually using these tools use it, um, that has sort of obscured some of our understanding of what's going on. Um, and in terms of the heterogeneity and uptake, like why certain divisions would use certain tools and others wouldn't, um, I mean, I think there's a number of reasons. Like the first one um, is just that there was resistance within the police department to some of these tools, and some people had more power to resist the tools than others. So this came up. I, I didn't initially intend to study resistance um, in this research project, but on my very first ride along, you know, we were responding to a call for service. Um, I, I was with a sergeant at the time, and I, I watched him manually type into his in-car laptop that, that we were code six at a particular address, meaning basically we had arrived at this address. 
And as I mentioned earlier, you know, like I picked the LAPD because they are so technologically advanced. And so I was sort of surprised that he was manually typing his location into the laptop. And so I asked him, you know, like, isn't there some automated mechanism for knowing where the distribution of vehicles are throughout the city? And he said, oh, yeah, you know, there is actually every car is equipped with an AVL or an automatic vehicle locator that pings the location of the car every five seconds. But they're not turned on because of resistance from the police officers union. And so it was sort of in that moment that I realized, you know, the police officers reactions to um these new tech surveillance technologies, whether they are surveillance technologies used to surveil civilians or themselves, um, that really like determines how and whether these tools are embraced or rejected, whether they're contested or or sort of adopted widely. Um, there also is, you know, different sort of political reasons um, that that certain individuals within the police department would would use these tools and would not. And, and personal preference played a role as well in the sense that, you know, I found that um, some folks who were closer to retirement were hesitant to want to try and adopt these new tools. They were like, this is going to be a pretty steep learning curve. I'm about to retire in a year and a half. Like I'm not going to implement this in my division. Whereas individuals who were sort of looking at um, their potential channels for promotion in the next five or 10 years, you know, being conversant in data analytics and and using data effectively in your division can sort of be an effective um, way of moving up in the organization. So there was even individual level variation like that as well. So we've gotten into some detail about how these tools are adopted and used, how they're how they relate to police departments themselves. And I want to move a bit into understanding how they affect the relationship between police departments and communities. Uh, two of your earlier chapters examine the changing character due to big data policing of dragnet surveillance and of directed surveillance. So to ground this discussion a bit, could you provide some examples of these two methods? Sure. So dragnet surveillance just refers to the surveillance of everyone rather than only the people under some sort of criminal suspicion. So an example of a dragnet surveillance tool would be um, like an automatic license plate reader or ALPERS. And automatic license plate readers are basically these cameras. They can be mounted at static locations like an intersection or they can be mounted. um, They can be dynamic like on a cop car, for example. And they essentially take two photos of every vehicle that passes through their line of vision, one of the car, one of the license plate, and then it records the time, date, and geo coordinates. And so you're basically able to sort of start to develop a map of the distribution of vehicles throughout a city. Um, you can learn what people's typical travel patterns are. You can infer where they might be where they might be sleeping at night based on where their car is repeatedly parked outside. So that's an example of a dragnet surveillance tool in the sense that you don't have to have done anything um, in order to be in the database of vehicles picked up by these automatic license plate readers. Dragnet surveillance, or sorry, directed surveillance in contrast to dragnet surveillance, has to do with the surveillance of people or places deemed higher risk of involvement in criminal activity. So if you have um, predictive policing is kind of like an emblematic example of this. So with place-based predictive policing, for example, which is typically used to predict property crime, you would use historical crime data past you know, types, times, places um, that historical crimes were committed, use that as the training data in order to predict areas at higher risk of crime occurring on the next shift. And then you would deploy officers accordingly, say, you know, go to these predictive boxes, spend time there. You'll either maybe deter crime, displace crime, or intercept a crime in process. So that would be an example of directed surveillance. You can similarly have um, person-based predictive policing for predicting violent crime, say. So the ideology or logic behind that being that if you have Um, A small group of people disproportionately responsible for the majority of violent crime. If you're able to use predictive algorithms to identify those individuals and police them more heavily, then perhaps you can have um, a reductive effect on on crime in that way. That's sort of like the underlying logic um, there. Right, yeah, I appreciate it. So both of these methods have been influenced by the rise of big data policing methods, and you describe a qualitative difference between how these changes manifested. Uh, directed surveillance has been amplified, as you put it, and dragnet mm-hmm. surveillance has been transformed. So, mm-hmm. what makes 
maybe describe what the difference in, in what, what you mean by those two terms, but also what makes big data infused dragnet policing a novel phenomenon. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So when I say that um, uh, directed surveillance is like amplified with the introduction of, of big data policing, um, if you take predictive policing again, sort of as a concrete example, what I mean by that basically is like the police have always been spending more time in certain neighborhoods, right? Or policing more people more heavily than others. And yes, indeed, you know, predictive algorithms are are now directing police to particular areas or to particular people. And it, it might be slightly different than it was in the past, but I think it's largely like a quantified recapitulation of existing police practices or of longstanding police practices. By contrast, I think there's something more fundamentally transformative going on, um, some, something newer going on um, in terms of dragnet surveillance in the sense that as we go about our everyday lives, right, we're leaving these massive digital trails and everyone is potentially a suspect now in the sense that we don't need to have any direct police contact in order to have our digital traces in law enforcement corpus, like in law enforcement bodies of data that they are using. And so as a result, it's sort of um, changing or transforming, increasing the scope of individuals under law enforcement surveillance, and also making it possible for the police to follow any one single person across a greater range of institutional settings. So if the police can access, you know, digital traces that we leave in terms of our shopping, our, our driving patterns, our, our cell phone locations, all of these types of things, um, I think there's something fundamentally transformative going on. And I want to come back to that um, in a later question, but let me um, jump to a later chapter for my following. Um, the ability to obtain and link multiple sources of data, you've touched on this a bit, mm. as you say, combinatorially increases the user's ability to connect data elements, which include persons. Mm -hmm. So specifically in the legal context, has a consensus emerged over how to handle these new abilities? No. <laughs> There is there is not legal consensus over, the, and I mean I I will be watching um, Supreme and lower court decisions on this with great interest over the next ten or twenty years. There's sort of there's kind of a, a lag um, in terms of a lot of these new technologies are, are are changing and emerging much faster than the legal and regulatory responses to these new tools. But um, no, there is not a consensus. So. And I think that part of that has to do with the fact that, you know, many of our laws and checks on police action and police or, or state, in the broadest sense, government intrusion into individuals' lives were created in sort of an analog world and are kind of anachronistic when we think about what some of these legal concepts mean today. So like even something as basic as a search, right? There are checks and balances on certain thresholds that police need to meet in order to conduct a search. And so you have like basic con legal concepts around reasonable suspicion or probable cause. Um, but now today, like, what does a search mean in the digital age? You know, previously, it's like you can't enter somebody's private property. You can't rummage through their drawers with receipts. You can't, like, reach into their pockets. But what about querying uh, an automatic license plate reader database, right? And is does that constitute a search? Or does it make a difference if that database is owned by a police department versus a repossession agency? Because there are private companies like repossession agencies that have um, automatic license plate reader readings. And so some of these these questions and these fundamental legal concepts are, 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 are sort of thrown into disarray when we are trying to apply these, these laws and, and regulations that were developed in sort of an analog world into the digital context. And so, you know, there, there are a number of different um, legal theories and approaches, like, you know, we have this idea of mosaic theory where as you mentioned, having to do with like the, the combination of different data points yields a level of insight into an individual's life, but no one data point is necessarily in violation of, um, of, of constitutional law in that kind of sense. But there definitely is no consensus of, of how to deal with these things. So I want to talk a bit about how to think about the effects of these tools. And to begin, I'd like you to comment on an analogy you use between data and capital. So earlier you discussed 
the way that data collection, the, the, the collection of data provides raw material for future data collection. And at some point you talk about data creep, uh, the use of data for, uh, for purposes which was not originally intended. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this capital analogy, you talk about cumulative advantage, which is a concept that people in a lot of quantitative fields will be familiar with, uh, mm-hmm. colloquially called the rich get richer phenomenon. Yeah. So in all these in, in, in any of these directions, how does um, this analogy manifest in practice? Yeah, I mean, so thinking of data as a form of capital, as I suggest in the book, is is sort of meant to to help move beyond this idea of data as um, sort of like some objective or unbiased or mechanical reflection of the world, you know, purely purely descriptive, and and rather focus on how data is this valuable resource. It's something that can be commodified, um, used to make decisions to to create opportunities and constraints in individuals' lives, um, and and can be a good good or bad thing, right, in the context of cumulative advantage or disadvantage. So, you know, on the one hand, if you have your consumer data might give you like more targeted or specific ads, um, that type of thing. In the criminal legal contexts, it sort of only really works in one direction. And that generally is that the more data on you in terms of like the more times you're stopped by the police, um, the longer your arrest history, all of these types of things, that tends to lead to cumulative disadvantage, where instead of it's like, oh, cumulative advantage, the rich get richer, it's basically leads to individuals that were already under pretty heavy police surveillance, getting under more and more police surveillance. And it creates essentially this like feedback loop, wherein individuals um, with high point scores, for example, they because they have been stopped by the police multiple times, they have prior arrests, this type of thing. The police are then told at the beginning of their shift, go out and stop these individuals with high point scores. Then the police go out and stop these individuals. But one of the things that is inputted into de- determining their point scores is how many times they've been stopped by the police in the past. And so it leads basically to this like recursive loop um, that's very difficult to to sort of get out of. And again, you've anticipated uh, my next question, uh, which is this is one of several ways you describe in which data intensive policing can exacerbate social inequality or increase disparities in social and economic capital. Hmm. Are there other ways you want to talk, speak to uh, to how this happens or how this could happen? Um, and also, are these effects intrinsic to the tools being adopted? Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. So, in the predictive policing context, you know, I, I was just mentioning person based predictive policing, but we can focus on place based for a second, right? And so, if with place based predictive policing, you know, it's p- the historical crime data that's used as the training data to feed into the predictive policing algorithm, and then it identifies in the LA context, basically it was these like 500 square foot boxes where crime is likely to occur in the future. And the patrol officers are told at the beginning of their shift, you know, go check in on these predictive boxes, spend some time there and we'll measure your what's called dosage in these neighborhoods. Okay, fine. So the police go there. Well, then of course they're more likely to observe something occurring and pick up crime data in the neighborhoods that they are being deployed to. And so it can, again, sort of lead to this like self-reinforcing or self-fulfilling prophecy, wherein they're told, go police these particular neighborhoods or particular areas. They're more likely to detect crime occurring in those neighborhoods, which then feeds back into the predictive policing algorithm and has them going to those places again more in the future. So that's sort of the first half of the disparity issue is that it can lead to these self-fulfilling prophecies. But then the second half is that it actually really like makes a lot of this harder to challenge, right? So if say like the police stop somebody who, because they have a high point score, they, you know, are, are identified as like being higher risk of engaging in future criminal activity or whatever saying, Oh, you know, I stopped you because you're on parole or probation or you have a high points value is like much less, um, problematic uh, on its face than saying, oh, you know, I stopped you because you're a young black male, right? Which is like obviously massively contestable. And so I think that like there is this um, utility, again, going to the data as capital argument in data in that way. And that even if it is sort of reinforcing longstanding police practices, there is a use for the actual data in the sense that it serves to legitimize a lot of these um, practices in a way. 
Now, your book focuses on crime prevention and investigation, but a lot of recent criticism has been leveled at the scope of services expected of police, for example, enforcing traffic violations and responding Mm -hmm. to mental health crises. I wonder if you've encountered ways in which big data resources play important roles in these or other activities or have been talked about, discussed as potentially doing so. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. So, you know, one of the things that I really noticed when I was going on ride alongs was how like depressing and sad a lot of this was like the types of reasons that um, police would be responding to calls for service. So, you know, a lot of domestic disputes or individuals, as you mentioned, having mental health crises or, um, um, you know, people being suicidal and and calling the police or, or having a drug overdose or something like that. And I think that like, one of the the issues at play here is that the police are sort of the default responder to so many um, quote unquote problems in American society. And part of that has to do with the fact that we have like quite an anemic welfare state compared to other advanced industrialized nations. And so one thing from a policy perspective that I think that we should consider is, you know, police have sort of narrowly, if, if, you know, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Police have been sort of narrowly focusing on, on crime and deterrence and surveillance in this type of way. And how can we, how can, how can police leverage data more effectively in order to respond to these, these kinds of issues. But I think that, you know, normatively, we should be thinking more broadly about how can we use prediction and data in order to actually reallocate resources, not just within police departments, but away from police departments and towards not more, less punitive, more community-based sort of empathetic type interventions um, that that are probably going to be more, or that may be more effective than the police um, at responding to some of these very depressing and and sad situations. I want to possibly come back to that in a couple of questions. Um, and now to kind of take an overview of the book, you redefine early on big data, not in terms of its technical dimensions, as is commonly done in quantitative circles, the the four or three or five Vs, uh, depending Mm -hmm. on whom you read, but as a certain kind of data environment, uh, which I take to be your first move in the case for understanding big data as social. Why is this important? Yeah, man, I so I don't even know what the fifth V is. I've definitely heard of the three Vs. I didn't know there was five Vs now. But but yeah, so I think, you know, some sometimes it's like volume, velocity, variety, this type of thing. And when I say that, you know, big data is a data environment, I think that what I'm trying to get at there is that it's less about the nature and the structure of the data itself that is what is really um, consequential for reshaping social relations in the digital age. Instead, it is this like broader environment in which you have different, often competing organizations all trying to collect their own data, analyze their own data, leverage their own data, make decisions using these different sources of data, and then sharing data with one another, sometimes blocking data sharing between one another, that there's this broader sort of political, economic, social environment in which data is this commodity that is highly consequential for individual and group outcomes. And so I think that's sort of what I'm trying to get at with the with the big data environment being what we should sort of um, be paying attention to when understanding sort of like the digital field that we exist in nowadays. And a very related question, I think you say late in the book that the law, we've talked a a little bit earlier about uh, the legal understanding or implications, uh, is insufficiently sociological uh, in this, in this setting. So it's a point I think it would be important to explain. So could you? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of um, checks on police power, as I mentioned before, are like at at one point in time. So they have to do either with um, uh, controls on the point of data collection or controls on one police civilian encounter. But rather what a lot of big data policing looks like now is sort of these ongoing decisions that are made about people's 
so-called data doubles or their digital doubles. These like these um, constructions of us, all of these different data points about us that the police are in an ongoing fashion making decisions about who to police, where to police, what to do, who to stop, who to collect data on, all of these types of things. And so I think that, um, you know, it, it's when I say the law is insufficiently sociological, I think the law does not is not structured in such a way that it can account for like the so-called life course of data, right? It's just these one point in time controls on police civilian interactions. Is a police officer allowed to conduct a search at this point in time? Does a police officer meet the threshold of being able to arrest someone in this context? Instead, surveillance is much more programmatic and ongoing and suspicionless um, in the digital age. Would atomized be a fair characterization uh, in addition to the, the terms you've used? Yes. That Sorry, that surveillance, you are saying surveillance is atomized in the digital age or it's not? In the, so both the police practice of surveillance, but also the, the way in which it's handled legally seems... Yes, um, exactly. Yes. The way okay. it's handled legally is atomized. Yes, correct. As opposed to in the sociological context where connections or relations are the most important thing. Yes. Yes. Okay. I would agree with that take. Thank you. So I actually see an analogous point to be made about mathematics and related fields. And I think we have something to learn from your observations about law. So I wanted to ask or give you a chance to say, what should mathematics professionals or other quantitative professionals be remembering or imagining as they or we conduct work that has social consequences, including the use of data intensive policing? I mean, I think that the very first point is to get away from this idea that the data that one is using in order to make predictions is some kind of pure mechanical reflection of the world. Instead, the data is filtered through very like social and organizational prisms rife with power dynamics and all of these kinds of things. And so it's like, okay, let's say, you know, we have, and and in some ways that, you know, this is like basic social science principles around sampling. And I think part of it has to do with just a a disciplinary difference in, you know, like in computer science, you're sort of trained that like, this is our, my corpus of data. What are the different insights that I can glean from it? Whereas in social science, you know, there's a lot of attention paid to like, what are the sampling mechanisms? How can we get a representative sample? Who's included, who's excluded from it. And so I think that like the first thing to sort of recognize is what is, what are these data actually a reflection of. And then secondly, is I think that like the more we can move out of the purely theoretical and towards more concrete implementation questions, we are able to have better policy in the sense that like you could have a an algorithm with 100% predictive accuracy but then if people use it on the, don't even use it on the ground or they use it on the ground in some like really messed up way, then it's not going to be a perfect solution to any problem that you are trying to come up with. So I think that, you know, my bias as a sociologist is of course going to be to towards paying attention to the, the so-called like social side of big data. But I think that, um, you know, interdisciplinary work in this space is like really, really crucial for, um, for anything to to sort of like be efficacious in in that sense. So let me begin winding down and and ask if you see any urgent research needs in connection to your work, whether they be in sociology or in computational sciences. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I think that one of the things um, that's critical, especially as we're sort of in this in this moment where like defund is on the national stage and 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 questions about how can we use data to, to better allocate um, resources between um, police and, and community based organizations and such. I think that um, a lot of policy interventions are rolled out in a very unsystematic way that makes it very difficult to actually have an evidence base for what works and what doesn't, what the positive and negative consequences of certain interventions are. Um, And so I think, you know, like in the context of predictive policing in Los Angeles, right, like these tools were sort of rolled out really unsystematically and there ended up being at the at the behest of some community based groups this like office of the inspector general report about the efficacy of these tools and basically they were they 
all they were able to say is like, we don't really have evidence as to whether or not these tools work, but here's a bunch of the sort of harms that we have. And so I think the more we can actually grow an evidence base about the efficacy of um, institutions and organizations and interventions that are alternatives to the police will make it possible to actually have informed policy around de-scoping the police, like the types of things that police actually are responding to and are engaging about. Because I think that right now we're just sort of like in this in this loop or this this trap wherein it's like the police are responding to all of these issues, many of which I think might be better addressed by others. So let me ask an open-ended question. What is another piece of scholarship or media that you think makes a good companion to yours? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, Yeah, I mean, I love sort of putting different pieces in conversation with one another in that kind of way. So, okay, a book that I've really loved recently um, is this book called Ballad of the Bullet, and it's written by a sociologist named Forrest Stewart. And essentially he is looking at, um, in that book, the so-called digital trails that youth in a particular neighborhood in Chicago leave online in the form of um, like drill music, like drill rap, basically. So they, they create these videos, da, da, da. And then he looks at how that is used in the criminal legal process. So how folks are policed, um, how they're, and and what's so interesting about this, and this gets to sort of like moving away from this idea as data is objective or unbiased, is a lot of these kids post in, in the videos stuff that like isn't even real or isn't even true, but has very negative consequences for their lives, right? So they'll post videos like, where they're holding guns and it's not even their guns or like money and it's not even their money. Or they will say that they're in a particular neighborhood um, um, where there's some sort of like rival gang operating to them and they're not actually there, but then they end up putting themselves in danger because they think that they're in this neighborhood. And I think that it's like a really, really interesting, it's a very different focus than my book, but it's this like fascinating on the ground account of how the digital trails that we leave, even if intentional, can simultaneously be like very hurtful and harmful in our own lives, depending on how they are interpreted. That sounds incredibly fascinating. I will look out for it. Thank you. So uh, the traditional final question is, what are you working on now? And in particular, are any future book projects in mind? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I thought that by the time this like book came out, I would be so tired of thinking about this or studying this, and I would want to do something completely different. But um, no, it turns out I'm still obsessed with this topic. So what I'm doing right now is I'm starting to um, follow some of my findings into subsequent phases of criminal legal processing. So my ethnographic data collection, it really stops at the point of arrest um, or of police contact. And so now what I'm doing is um, I'm interviewing, for example, like a number of public defenders in order to try and understand how digital information um, is used at subsequent stages of criminal legal proceedings. So like how is individual social media data relevant at um, in terms of plea bargaining? Or how is um, information gleaned from cell phone extractions used at the sentencing phase? Or, you know, um, uh, what kind of digital evidence is introduced in the few cases that end up going to trial? So I'm sort of following it into subsequent fra- phases of criminal legal processing. Um, and then another project that I'm working on is um, looking at kind of how uh, regular civilians, like not police officers, are purchasing and consuming surveillance devices in new kinds of ways. So if you think about like Amazon ring doorbells, etc., to what extent is there this like deputization process of surveillance going on through technology um, and sort of what are the implications of that? So those are a couple of the, the things that I'm working on, but I'm also um, interested in doing Um, a comparative project wherein I look at how um, the same type of predictive algorithm can be used in different institutional contexts for predicting different kinds of things and then asking, does that lead to similar or different 
outcomes. So like in the criminal legal context, the police use predictive algorithms to predict where crime is likely to occur. Okay, fine. Well, what about in the educational context when um, individuals use like student data in order to say predict students that are at higher risk of dropping out or higher risk of whatever in terms of educational attainment do the same types of dynamics around the like obscuring and amplifying of inequalities play out or are there quite quite different empirical outcomes um so in sort of a more longer term project i'm i'm going to be doing some comparative work in that kind of way they sound like very interesting projects to follow up on i hope you'll consider coming back to the new books network to talk about them when they're published oh thanks absolutely Thank you. I've been talking with Sarah Brain, author of Predict and Surveil, published by Oxford in 2021. Sarah, thanks again very much for joining me. Thank you.